Welcome to this final lesson in our series Investigating Electromagnetic Radiation. In this series we have explored what electromagnetic radiation is and have seen how people have used their understanding of this form of energy in different ways. We have found out that electromagnetic radiation can be represented by both a wave and a particle model. So the model that best represents electromagnetic radiation is wave-particle duality. In this lesson, we are going to apply the idea of wave-particle duality to matter. We will then see how our new understanding of the nature of matter has resulted in the development of the electron microscope. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to Use the idea of wave-particle duality to calculate the wavelength of subatomic particles and describe how an electron microscope works. Let's start this lesson by thinking about what happens when particles collide. Remember that any particle that is moving has momentum. Momentum is the product of the mass and the velocity of an object. So this ball with a mass of 0,5 kilograms that is moving at 2 meters per second has a momentum of 1 kilogram meter per second. Now to find the momentum of a photon we need to refer to work done by Einstein. He used three equations. Firstly his famous equation energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared. Secondly the energy of a photon, E, is equal to Planck's constant, H, times the frequency of the photon, F. And thirdly, the momentum, P, is equal to mass, M, times the speed of light, C. By manipulating these three equations, he found an equation for the momentum of a photon in terms of frequency, the speed of light, and Planck's constant. Can you see how to do this? Here's one way to do this. We'll start by rearranging E equals mc squared to get the equation m equals E divided by c squared. Next, we multiply both sides of the equation by c. Now you should see that on the left hand side we have m times c and on the right hand side we have E times c divided by c squared. This can be simplified to E divided by C. Also notice that from the third equation M times C equals momentum P. So now we have P equals E divided by C. But from equation 2 we know that E equals HF. Let's substitute HF for E into our equation. This gives us P, the momentum of a photon, equals HF divided by C. Now you should recall that C, the speed of light, equals the frequency times the wavelength of an electromagnetic wave. So we can simplify the equation for the momentum of a photon further by substituting for C. When we do the substitution we get P equals H divided by lambda. So here we have an equation for the momentum of a photon in terms of wavelength and Planck's constant. This equation provides a link between the particle nature of light, its momentum, and its wave nature, its wavelength. But what about other particles? Do they also have a dual nature? We know that a ball and an electron can both have momentum because they have mass and velocity. But would you think that a ball or an electron has a wavelength? Well, in 1924, that's exactly what a French physicist, Louis de Broglie, suggested. He said that if electromagnetic radiation, such as light, could have both wave and particle properties, then it must be possible that a particle could have wave properties. He used the same equation Einstein used for the momentum of a photon, to calculate the momentum of a particle. 
So the momentum of any particle is equal to Planck's constant divided by wavelength. Now the implication of this equation is quite astonishing. By saying that any particle has a momentum related to its wavelength, de Broglie implied that all moving particles move with a wave nature. To find the wavelength of a particle, we change the equation p equals h divided by lambda to make lambda the subject. So we have lambda equals h divided by p. But remember that momentum p is equal to mass times velocity. This equation is known as de Broglie's particle wave equation. The wavelength of a particle is called the de Broglie wavelength. Now that we have a basic understanding of the theory, let's see how this works in practice. Calculate the de Broglie wavelength of a cyclist of mass 50 kilograms traveling at 13,2 meters per second. Using de Broglie's equation and substituting in the values we have been given, we get the wavelength is equal to 6,63 times 10 to the minus 34 divided by 50 times 13,2. This gives us a wavelength of 1,0 times 10 to the minus 36 meters. This is an incredibly small value, and if indeed the cyclist has a wave nature, it would be too small to measure. But if we have an electron of mass 9,2 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, moving at 8 times 10 to the 6 meters per second, could we detect its wave nature? Once again, we used de Broglie's equation, this time substituting in the values for the electron. So now the wavelength would be equal to 6,63 times 10 to the minus 34 divided by 9,2 times 10 to the minus 31 multiplied by 8 times 10 to the 6. This gives us a wavelength of 9,0 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. Now this wavelength is much larger than the wavelength of the cyclist. In fact, it is similar to the wavelength of x-rays and so is large enough for us to detect its wave nature. When x-rays pass through very thin aluminum foil, we see a number of concentric circles that are dark and light. The bright circles are formed by constructive interference and the dark parts are formed by destructive interference. We say that the x-rays have been diffracted by the aluminium foil. Only waves can produce interference by diffraction, so x-rays definitely have a wave nature. In order to test de Broglie's theory, we need to know whether small, fast-moving particles, such as electrons, are able to produce diffraction patterns too. Experiments to test de Broglie's theory were first performed by Clinton Davison and Lester Germer, American physicists, and George Thompson, a British physicist. In this sort of experiment, electrons are emitted from a hot negative cathode called an electron gun. They are accelerated by a strong electric field between the cathode and a positive anode. The electrons are confined to a narrow beam by a small hole in the anode. The electrons finally pass through the thin aluminium foil and are diffracted. The diffraction pattern forms on a screen. The whole process takes place in a vacuum. Thomson adjusted the speed of the electrons emitted by the electron gun so that the electrons would exhibit a de Broglie wavelength that was similar to the wavelength of X-rays. The diffraction pattern obtained is very similar to the ones formed by X-rays, so clearly these electrons are behaving like waves. It is also possible to demonstrate diffraction patterns with other subatomic particles such as protons and neutrons. The fact that all these particles can produce a diffraction pattern proves de Broglie's theory that all moving particles have a wave nature. 
and have a wavelength equal to Planck's constant, h divided by the mass of the particle, m times the velocity of the particle, v. We can use the knowledge that particles and, in particular, electrons have a wave nature to see incredibly tiny structures and objects. An optical microscope, the type you might use at school, uses glass lenses and light to form an image of an object that is about 500 times larger than the object. Light travels through the specimen being viewed, is refracted by the lenses and then forms an image on the observer's eye. This is only possible because light has a wave nature. But the magnification produced by an optical microscope is too small for us to see very small structures and objects, such as the structure of an ice crystal or a microorganism. These structures are smaller than the wavelength of light and so cannot be detected by light. In the 1930s and 1940s, scientists developed the electron microscope. These microscopes enable us to form images of objects that have been magnified by about 2 million times. Instead of using light and lenses, the electron microscope uses a beam of electrons focused by electromagnets, which act like lenses. Here, an image forms because the invisible electrons travel at high speed through the specimen being viewed and are refracted by the magnetic field to form an image. This only happens because electrons have a wave nature with a wavelength that is smaller than the size of the structure being examined. There are two main types of electron microscopes. Firstly, the transmission electron microscope and secondly, the scanning electron microscope. Let's look at the transmission electron microscope first. In this microscope, a high voltage electrical potential is used to accelerate electrons to very high speeds. These electrons all have equal de Broglie wavelengths. They are focused into a narrow beam by the first condenser. This is a solenoid that produces a magnetic field which changes the paths of the electrons and so controls the size and brightness of the spot that will hit the sample being viewed. When the beam strikes the sample, parts of the beam are transmitted or pass through the sample. These electrons are then focused by the objective system and project a lens into an image. The image then strikes a phosphor screen. Phosphor is a compound which glows when charges strike it. When the electrons hit the phosphor screen, light is generated, allowing a person to view the image. This image is an image of volcanic ash. The darker areas of the image represent those areas of the sample through which fewer electrons were transmitted, and the lighter areas represent places where more electrons were transmitted. A scanning electron microscope works in much the same way as a transmission electron microscope until the electrons reach the sample. Here a set of scanning coils moves the beam of electrons back and forth across the sample. As the electrons hit each spot on the sample, secondary electrons are knocked off from the sample surface. A detector then counts these secondary electrons and send signals to an amplifier, which then builds up the final image based on the number of electrons emitted from each spot on the sample. The image formed is similar to the one we get from a transmission electron microscope, but gives a better 3D view of the structure. Let's visit Mintec, where they regularly use a different scanning electron microscopes. Sometimes we need to extend our senses to see those things that we can't see. When things are too small to observe with the naked eye, we use devices such as this, the scanning electron microscope, to enlarge those to a very great extent. The way it works is very similar to a television. In a television you have an electron gun that fires a beam of electrons through a vacuum tube and when it hits the surface it excites a phosphor that gives off light and it builds up an image dot by dot by dot. And the scanning electron microscope does very much the same thing. At the top here we've got a source of electrons 
that is emitted down a tube that's free of air called a column and electron beam is scanned across the surface of our specimen and builds up an image dot by dot by dot, very similarly to that of a television. The principle of the electron microscope relies on the wave particle nature of the electrons. Now the electrons are excited and accelerated down the column, have a very high energy, so therefore they have a very small wavelength. The wave particle nature of electrons in this microscope is very important because it can give us different kinds of information. One of the characteristics of waves is that they can be diffracted, and the same happens with electrons. We're able to pass these electrons down the column, let them hit the sample, and let it be diffracted by the planes of atoms that are present in our crystal. And by looking at these diffracted planes, we're able to tell what the sample is made of and what the crystal structure is. This is very important for us to know as scientists. Now that you have seen how the idea of an electron as a wave has been used, there is one more impact that de Broglie's idea has had on our understanding of matter. A scientist by the name of Erwin Schrödinger took de Broglie's theory and applied it to the structure of the atom. He suggested that the earlier atomic models which treated electrons as particles needed to be modified. Since electrons have a wave nature, he showed that they do not actually orbit around the nucleus as planets around the Sun. He developed mathematical equations to describe electrons as waves around the nucleus. Instead of particles moving around the nucleus, we have electrons moving as standing waves through an area with a particular energy. He called the area which the waves occupied orbitals. So the orbital model of the atom, which you have studied before, is actually a result of treating an electron as a wave. Isn't it amazing that the strange idea of wave-particle duality has had such a huge impact on technology and on our ideas about the atom? Now, for your task for today, I want you to solve the following problems. Calculate the de Broglie wavelength of a proton with a mass of 1,67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, traveling at 1,5 times 10 to the 3 meters per second. Can you explain why electrons in an electron microscope have to be accelerated to very high speeds? Well, this brings us to the end of our series investigating electromagnetic radiation. We have seen that electromagnetic radiation comes from the Sun and other stars and fills the universe but also helps us explain the nature of the atom. Thanks for joining me. Goodbye.